Testing, testing, check, check. Can you hear me in the back? Uh, let's see. Keaton, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Fiona, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Right. It's like calling roll, but uh, pretending it's a mic check. Hey, it's great to see everybody here. Um, my notes here say that I'm going to uh, have a few words of welcome, and then Brooke Larson is going to introduce Darren. But Brooke doesn't feel well, so she's not here. Um, she sends her love to all of you. Uh, so I'm going to do all of that. So brace yourself. My name is Jeffrey McCarthy. I'm the director of the Environmental Humanities Program here at the University of Utah. Uh, I'm also the PI on a fabulous Mellon grant that supports community engagement with initiatives like the Community Practitioner in Residence uh, position that Darren holds this semester. We're just delighted to have Darren here this semester, and we're delighted to have him here tonight. So in this sense, tonight's talk is part of a national movement to listen. Is this thing going in and out? Is it working? Not working, right? Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, can you hear me back there, Keegan? Yeah. Broadcasting? Good. All right. So, um, I'm fine either way. I just need to know which one it is. Uh, where were we? We were celebrating Darren. Um, so, delighted to have Darren here. Uh, I was making the point that tonight's talk is part of a national, uh, is part of a sort of national flow towards paying attention to Native voices to recognizing indigenous wisdom. Uh, this is being supported at the level of the graduate program, at the level of the College of Humanities, at the level of the university, and at the level of national foundations. I'm not saying it's an enormous success yet, but the, uh, um, the flow is in the correct direction because these perspectives have been silenced. They've been overlooked by Western society. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to push in the other direction and have Darren Perry here at the University of Utah because we do have a lot to learn. Darren's attention to the Bear River is shaped by generational knowledge, knowledge of pleasure, knowledge of trauma, and now knowledge of resilience. Restoration is a word we hear. Restoration is a word associated often with ecology. But in Darren's hands, we find restoration is also cultural, also personal. These interwoven versions of restoration model relationships between people and nature and between people and people. Such a resilient, inclusive relationship is important to affirm as the climate crises and the political crises roll across the Western world. I want to say thanks to a few people. I want to say thanks to Darren. I want to thank Brooke, who presumably is here online. I want to thank Corey Pike uh, for her work with students and with the um, uh, media event, media uh, apparatus here. I want to thank our Dean, Hollis Robbins, for supporting Indigenous Studies uh, in the college. Finally, I want to thank all of you for showing up. Uh, Talks need audiences. Talks happen in places. This place is the unceded ancestral territory of the Goshen, Ute, Shoshone, and Pike people. For our virtual attendees, we're utilizing the technology of Zoom. Zoom is based in San Jose, California, on the, uh, on the unceded territory of the Ohlone people. Uh, and because tonight, Darren will be talking about the Bear River Massacre, we also want to acknowledge that Fort Douglas, where our building is, uh, where, where the Environmental Humanities building is, um, it, it was the base from which the US military spread out in order to uh, um, murder more than 400 Shoshone people in January of 1863, 150 years ago. Tonight, we talk about this hard truth and reimagine what creative collaborations towards repair might look like. We know that merely acknowledging the land, acknowledging this native history is not enough. It's our program's mission to integrate 
this present acknowledgement uh, of uh, where we stand now with a past that built up to it. That's why we have this practitioner in residence program. Uh, and that's why we're delighted to share our resources and our attention with Darren Perry. We hope that after this event, you'll continue to pay attention to news about the Bear River, uh, to news about the uh, Northwest Band of Shoshone Nation's efforts to restore, repair, and heal at the site of the Bear River Massacre. So with that, let me just introduce Darren's background. Darren is the former chairman and current councilman of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone. Darren serves on the board of directors for the American West Heritage Center in Wellsville. He's also on the Utah State Museum Board, the Utah Humanities Board, and the PBS Utah Board of Directors. So we're lucky to get him on a free night, it sounds. <laughs> um, Darren attended the University of Utah and Weber State University and received his bachelor's degree in secondary education with an emphasis on history. He used that emphasis on history to write his book, The Bear River Massacre, A Shoshone History, and he teaches Native American history at Utah State University. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Darren Perry. Can you hear me okay? I can't be this soft smoking native spoken Native American the way what I want to be. <laughs> but thank you for coming. I, I speak a lot. And every time I go to a venue, I worry that somebody will come and listen. So thank you for coming and listening. I want you to know that American history for a long time was written and taught as a single story. It was a narrative of nation building that united its participants into this single American experience. I guess you could say it was a national success story made possible in a society that was based on principles of liberty and equality or so we thought. I am still patiently waiting for the liberty and justice for all part. In years past, historians have sometimes ignored or dismissed peoples whose narratives didn't conform to that master narrative. Often dismissed were the experiences of the American Indian. After all, our story is one of decline and suffering rather than one of progress or happiness. But times change and the history and the stories that we tell about the past changes too. I have come to realize over a lifetime that when you reduce history to just data and when we remove some of the storytelling we lose the humanity that makes history so important. And I believe that's why our story is so important. If you were to drive along Highway 91, just north of Preston, Idaho, you'll round a big curve that opens up to a beautiful panoramic view of the Bear River bottomlands below. If you know where to look, you can still see the steam rising from the edge of the river. 168 years ago, in a couple of weeks, it was at that exact spot that some 700 members of my Shoshone people were wintering, as they had done for centuries. Hot springs nearby provided a welcome place for them to catch their breath catch up with family and friends during the cold winter months. We called that place Moso de Guani, which means home of the lungs. A half a mile to the east, Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his 220 cavalry had the same bird's eye view. 
on the early morning hours of January 29th in 1863. As they made their way down a ravine towards a sleeping Indian village. When something terrible happens, where human lives are lost, that place always seems to take on a new meaning. The 14.6 acres of the World Trade Centers, the beaches of Normandy, a homemade memorial at the side of the road where a traffic fatality occurred, places that haunt and hurt for the wounds that they hold but they still compel us to go back for some unexplainable comfort. Have you ever had a memory sneak out of your eye and roll down your cheek? I have that all the time when I think about the massacre of my people. For thousands of years, tribal elders would sit down with the children and tell them stories. You know, the stories were always the same. There was never a word out of place. It had to be that way. It had to be accurate. Our children needed to hear the stories as the elders had heard the stories. Because in my culture, nothing is ever written down. I went through this process with my grandmother, May Timbimbu Perry. She would sit for hours and tell me stories about how the coyote stole fire, how the bald eagle became bald. And then with reverence in her tone and sometimes a tear in her eye, she would relate the story of the massacre of Bo Ogai. There's an old Indian saying that says, when an old Indian dies, a library burns. That was never as true as it was about my grandmother. As I grew older and I had attended school, I developed this great love for history. And then sitting in class one day, I suddenly realized so. None of the stories that my grandmother told me were in our history books. How could that be? I'd always believed that historical events were an absolute. That events that transpired over time had one conclusion. But as I've gotten older, I've come to realize that history is always about perspective. Whose perspective? And then one day it became clear to me when I read a quote that was been attributed to Winston Churchill. He said that history is only written by the victors. Well, I guess that explains why Native American histories are never written. <clears throat> My Shoshone people referred to themselves as Niwa, which means the people. We looked upon the earth as not just a place to live, but something so sacred and special that we called her mother. She was always the provider of our livelihoods. You see the native people, the mountains and the streams and the plains stand forever. We believe the seasons walk around annually. We traveled to different areas when the game was plentiful and the seeds of berries were abundant. If you can imagine living that way, it was probably a hard way of life. I'm sure they were never more than a few days away from starvation, but it was a happy life. Every member of the tribe played an important role in its survival. That family relationship was sacred as it should be to you. In the summer of 1847, Sagwitch received word through a network of tribes that there were a group of white settlers making their way towards the Salt Lake Valley. And on July 31st, our chief Sagwitch, who happens to be my great, great, great grandfather, traveled to Salt Lake City to meet with Brigham Young and the first group of pioneers. He didn't meet with Brigham Young that day. He instead met with a man named Heber C. Kimball. At the conclusion of that meeting, Heber C. Kimball said, you do not own the land. The land belongs to our heavenly father and we calculate to plow and plant it. As you can imagine, within months, 
disputes arose among the Mormon pioneers and the Shoshone people on what my grandmother said was payment of rent. Sagwitch's life was now going to get complicated. Over the next few years, as more and more saints arrived in this beautiful valley, good land was now becoming scarce. In 1856, the church sent a man named Peter Mott north to settle the Cash Valley for good. That one act would have a devastating effect on my people. Not long after, other saints would soon arrive to that beautiful valley where I live today. In those early days, the saints referred to Sagwitch and his people as the friendly ones. As resources began to become scarce, those same saints referred to my people as thieves and beggars, which was probably true from their perspective. The irony though for me is that the saints themselves had suffered so much hate and injustice on their trek across this country. It's hard for me to believe that they could be found guilty of doing the same thing to my people. Peter Mond, who is now the area authority in the Cache Valley, said this, with extraordinarily good luck, the California volunteers will completely wipe them out. We wish this community rid of all such parties. And if Colonel Connor can be successful in reaching that bastard class of humans who play with the lives of the peaceable and the law abiding citizens in this way, we shall be pleased to acknowledge our obligations. So with this development, the use of the California and Oregon trails, which also cut through the heart of Shoshone land, I think my people have three options, beg for food, starve, or steal. Two different groups of people living two different lifestyles. In early January of 1863, the settlers, the Mormon settlers from Cache Valley and those using the trails to get to California and Oregon to the gold, began writing letters and sending them to Salt Lake for someone to come take care of the Indian problem. Arrest warrants were issued by a federal judge here in Salt Lake for the arrest of Pocatello, bear hunter and Sagwich and Sandwich. Colonel Patrick Connor and his Californian volunteers were now mustered into service. A Mormon scout named Porter Rockwell, who served as a guide, led Connor and his men just north of Logan, Utah, near Preston, Idaho, where Battle Creek meets Bohogai, or what we call the Bear River. Sagwich, being an early riser, got up as usual on the morning of the 29th. He left his TV and stood outside and surveyed the area around his camp. He noticed that the hills to the east had a cloud or a steaming mist. He watched it for a while and the mist started creeping down the hill. The chief realized what was taking place. The troops from Camp Douglas had arrived. He started calling to his village to gather whatever they could find to fight with. Some of our women picked up their woven winnowing pans to use them for shields. The troops came closer, they forded the river. And without so much as asking for the guilty parties, Connor and his men began to fire upon my people. But what are arrows compared to the rifles and sidearms of the soldiers? The soldiers massacred men, women, and children. My grandmother said our people were being slaughtered like wild rabbits. The massacre started early in the morning and lasted until early afternoon. The Bear River, which was slightly frozen earlier, was now starting to flow. Many of our people were jumping into the river to try to escape. 
You can imagine the blazing white snow was now brilliant red with blood. The willow trees that were used as hiding places were bent down as if in defeat. Many of our women were running with their children to jump into the river. Most all of them died. There was one woman named Angie Chi. She was a brand new mom that day. She told of being chased by the soldiers. She jumped into the rock water where there was a hot spring nearby. She swam under an overhanging bank to find refuge. When she got there, she found herself there with 10 other women who had had the same idea. They could hear the soldiers just above their heads on the bank wondering where they'd gone. And then it happened. Angie Chi's baby started to cry. Angie Chi was a brand new mom that day. She lived to be more than 100 years old. And she would often tell this story to the young children at the community of Wachiki years later. She told the children of jumping into the water and under the bank, of tending the seven bullet wounds that she'd had to her body. And then she told of having to drown her own baby so it wouldn't give up the location. The cruelest killing, though, was that of Bear Hunter. Knowing that he was one of the leaders, they had shot him and stabbed him and tortured him in many ways. Through all of that, the old chief wouldn't die and he wouldn't even cry out for mercy. Because of that, the military became angry. One of the men stepped to a burning campfire and heated his bayonet until it was glowing red. They ran that hot piece of metal through that chief's head from ear to ear. Bear Hunter went to his grave, a man of honor, and he left behind a wife and many small children. At the end of the massacre, Connor allowed a handful of Mormon settlers to walk the village to look for survivors. James Martineau was sickened by what he saw. He recorded in his journal that many of the squaws were killed because they would not lie down and submit to be ravished. He later told Peter Mon of sickening accounts of inhuman acts by the soldiers. He said after the Indians had been routed, they killed the wounded by knocking them in the head with an ax. The next morning at the request of Brigham Young, Three men from Franklin, William Ed, William Nelson, and William Hull, traveled to the massacre site looking for survivors and to record the number of dead. Hull later recorded in his journal, we drove our sleighs as far as the river. First sight to greet us was an old Indian man walking, slowly, arms folded, head bowed, lamenting the dead. He didn't speak to us. And he left heading towards the north. And then he said, never will I forget this scene. Dead bodies were everywhere. We counted eight deep in one place. And in several places, there were three to five deep. All in all, we counted more than 400 dead, two thirds of that number being women and children. We found two women alive whose thighs had been broken by bullets, two little boys and one little girl who looked to be about the age of three. The little girl was badly wounded, having received eight bullet wounds to her tiny body. We took them on our horses to the sleigh and made them as comfortable as possible. I can't imagine, but at this time, Sagwich must have realized that he was indeed living in two separate worlds. One group was greedy and wanted everything. The other group only wanted to live and travel as they'd done for centuries. One group was greedy 
and made their wishes and dreams come true by making themselves the conqueror at the expense of a defenseless people who only wanted to be left alone. Ralph Smith, another Franklin settler, summed up the sentiments of most of the Mormons. He said, we look upon the massacre as gruesome, but necessary. And then added, the work of Patrick Edward Connor and his soldiers was nothing less than an intervention from our Heavenly Father. Marianne Weston Mon, wife of Peter Mon, wrote in her journal, the residents of Cache Valley regarded Connor's efforts as an imposition of providence in our behalf and commented that the Indians had caused so much trouble that patience had ceased to be a virtue. Henry Ballard, Bishop of the Logan First Ward, said in his journal, this put a quietus upon the Indians. The Lord raised up his foe in Colonel Connor to punish them without us having to do it. We had borne a great deal from them, and yet we had still been feeding them. And yet some of the wicked spirits among them would stir up trouble against us. George Farrell, Secretary of the Logan Second Ward, recorded in the church's official minutes, that we the people of Cache Valley looked upon the movement of Connor as an intervention from the Almighty God, as the Indians had been a source of great annoyance to us for a very long time. And finally, in a letter from Peter Mon to Brigham Young, dated February 4th, Mon said, I feel my skirts rid of their blood. They rejected the way of life and salvation, which had been pointed out to them from time to time. And thus they have perished relying upon their own strength and wisdom. Just north of Preston, Idaho today, you will find an old monument just off the road on Highway 91. And by the way, you're all invited on January 29th of that. We have a one hour commencement. We were all invited if you'd like to go. This monument was erected in 1932 by the good people of Franklin County. It was meant to tell the story of the events of that fateful day. It was a celebrated event. The whole community came together to tell their stories, to remember their histories. What the monument really accomplished for me is that it gives people a reason to forget. That monument strips us of our obligation to act, find out for ourselves what actually took place. And that monument, like many other monuments, tells us how it wants the past to be remembered. You see, humans have great memories for what they want to remember. In commemorating something like this, the battle, you forget the uglier parts of history. And you only focus on the heroism of the soldier and the saint. That's the kind of daughters of Utah Pioneers monument that exists there today. But that narrative now becomes the story. It's not a story about my people. It becomes a story about the brave soldiers and the wonderful pioneer woman who took care of them. In constructing a monument like this, you firm up memory and you create a false history. You tell me, the plaque on the monument says, attacks by the Indians on the peaceful inhabitants in this vicinity led to the final battle here on January 29th in 1863. The conflict occurred in deep snow and bitter cold. Scores of wounded soldiers were taken from the battlefield to the Latter-day Saint community of Franklin. Here, pioneer women, trained through trials and necessities of frontier living, 
accepted the responsibility of caring for the wounded until they could be removed to Camp Douglas, Utah. Two Indian women found alive after the encounter were given homes in Franklin. So my question is, is this really what happened? The problem, and there are many, with that narrative for me is that it gives us one point of view from one generation's perspective, 69 years after the event. It's like a view from a window that has been carefully placed to exclude a whole quadrant of a beautiful landscape. You only get to see what they want you to see. It reinforces the view that Indians were savages. And I went so far as to label our women and children as combatants. It reinforces the view to many that violence on the frontier was necessary for the survival of Mormon communities and showed what the consequences would be if both groups tried to share the same space. Not very long ago, I took a bunch of fourth graders to this monument. It's always an adventure. Next to the monument is a tree. I call it the honor tree. People leave gifts, offerings for those who died that day. It's a beautiful tree. The other day when I was standing there with 70 fourth graders, a boy said, I see a mirror hanging in that tree. Why do you think somebody would hang a mirror in that tree? Well, I was frantically trying to come up with an answer, the answer of this young man. And a little girl standing next to me bailed me out. She said, I know. That mirror is there to remind us all that we did this and we could do it again if we don't learn from it. Fourth Peter. It made the hair on my head stand up. I was taught that day by a fourth grader. What do you think the plaque would have said if the Northwestern Shoshones would have written a plaque for the monument? Maybe it would have said something like this. The massacre of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation occurred in this vicinity on January 29th in 1863. Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, attacked a sleeping Indian village in the early morning hours of the day. The soldiers shot, raped, bludgeoned, and bayoneted several hundred men, women, and children to their death. The Indians fought back with the limited weapons available to them. But the band was all but annihilated. So which version of the massacre is correct? The answer will always lie in your perspective. The events that took place on that cold January morning have long been forgotten by most, if they've heard about it at all. Maybe guilt or remorse has silenced all those who one day may have wanted to know the truth. I hope that a new generation of people have a desire to listen and to learn. And it's not because we're looking to have things made right. We're not. But I've always believed that those who died at Bear River have a God-given right to be heard. Their voices speak to me from the dust. We remember and we honor the past because I believe it allows us to succeed in the future. I believe that the most successful Native Americans today are those who can best balance culture and change. We honor our culture. We honor those who have gone before. They are important to us. We honor them and their traditions. But as a tribal leader, I realize that we live in an ever-changing world. And it's my job to prepare them to change. 
and to succeed with it. The massacre of Bo Ogai has taught me many lessons over the years. One, it's taught me that bad things happen to people. How we respond to those events will determine your character. It has taught me to offer unconditional forgiveness, but it doesn't mean we need to forget. It has taught me that as we preserve history, it's important that all views are represented and respected. It has taught me that everyone has a story worthy of being told. What is your story going to be? Because your story is equally as important as mine. And it has taught me that the souls of my ancestors peer out from behind my mask of skin and that through my memories, they get to live again. Tell me a fact and I will learn. Tell me a truth and I will believe. Tell me a story that will live in my heart forever. Ultimately, the story of Bear River is our story. And in some ways, I would hope you can respect the story that we want to have told, as well as recognize your role within that story. You see, history doesn't always affirm us. Sometimes history challenges us to think about an uglier past that we'd rather not have. But that's really the power and the benefit of history. It connects us to the past. It connects us to our humanity and our inhumanity. And it offers us a way to move forward, especially in a circumstance like this with the Shoshone people and you, moving forward in a way that connects us not in the prettiest of ways, but allows us to move forward to this new relationship that I think is a 21st century relationship based on respect. Respect for the truth and what happened in that past moment. Then and only then is how we have the possibility for reconciliation. But how do we make reconciliation possible in such a seemingly divided world of where we live today, where Western values have taught us that we all have individual rights. You can't tell me what to do. Versus ind indigenous values that teach we have obligations. Obligations to the past, present, and future obligations to each other in our communities. Western worldviews are always scientific, often requiring proof as a basis for belief. Indigenous worldviews are based on a spiritually orientated society. This is a system based on a belief in the spirit world. To natives, land, water, are spiritual. Western worldviews say that there is only one truth based on law. Indigenous worldviews say that there can be many truths. Truths are dependent upon individual experiences. Western worldviews have a way of compartmentalizing society. Indigenous worldviews say that societies operate in a state of relatedness. Everything and everyone is related. Identity comes from these connections. Western worldviews say that the land and the water and our lakes and its resources should be available for extraction and depletion. <clears throat> Indigenous worldviews say that the land and water is sacred. 
and is only given to us by our Creator to be carefully and lovingly cared for. Western worldviews judge your success by how well you achieve your goals. Indigenous worldviews judge your success by the quality of your relationships with people. Western worldviews say that the human beings are the most important thing in the world. Indigenous worldviews say that human beings are not the most important thing in the world. And Western worldviews teach that amassing wealth should be done for personal gain. Indigenous worldviews say that amassing wealth is important, but only for the good of our communities. You know that the Iroquois Nation don't make any decisions without considering what effect that decision have, has on seven generations ahead. Think of the implications for our future if that is how our leaders governed. Man, I wish you could see the view I see. Take a look around. We're as varied and colorful as a beautiful field of wildflowers, each bringing with us our own individual characteristics and tech traits. As you look around tonight, I hope you can truly see each other and see the good in what you see. We need to be able to see through each other's eyes. When this happens, the possibilities are endless. The differences that we all bring to the table can be the strengths that we all draw from each other. Our life has brought us knowledge. Knowledge brings understanding. And greater understanding brings openness to other ways of seeing and being. Don't ever be afraid to forge a new path. It's important to remember that nobody is you. That's your superpower. Be the one who celebrates the different colors of our skins and embraces the opportunities that gives us to learn from each other. Be the one who breaks the cycle. If you are ever judged wrongly, choose to be understanding. If you were ever rejected, choose acceptance. If you were ever shamed, be the one who chooses compassion. Be the person you needed when things didn't go well and not the person that hurt you. And always, instead of holding on to a grudge, be the first one to forgive. I think about the values my grandmother taught me and the lessons that I could teach us today. I believe she would tell us to live as one, to cherish our likenesses, but celebrate the heck out of our differences, to honor our stewardship for this earth and all things that live on it and the sky above it. She would tell us to have gratitude for what we have, for those who made the trails for us to follow. And she would tell us to have reverence in our hearts. She would tell us to spread the kind of love that awakens the soul, that makes each one of us reach for more, that plants the fire in our hearts and brings peace to our minds. That's the kind of love this world needs today. Love, kindness, forgiveness, acceptance. I see you, I hear you. I accept you. Those affirmations and many more like them are what I like to call medicine words. I hope we can speak medicine words to those around us, but especially to our youth. Words that bless, power, and inspire. When we speak medicine words to each other, we build unity and we strengthen our cultures and our nation. One day as I was just finishing a presentation to a bunch of second graders, a little girl in the front row raised her hand and she said to me, how did you get to be the chief? So I told her this story. I said, when a young Shoshone boy or girl does an act of kindness or service, the chief in the tribe would give that boy or girl one eagle feather. I then said to her, what do you think would happen 
that boy or girl kept doing kind things. And she said, well, they'd get more eagle feathers. I said, what if they kept doing that until they became an adult? What do you think would happen then? And she said, well, by then they would have so many eagle feathers. And I said, you're right. I said, one day when the chief gets ready to die, and the chief is always the chief until he passes, he will call everyone up together and he will say to everyone, I'm about ready to meet my maker. I need to select a new chief. I want all of you to pull out your eagle feathers and show them to me. And then I told this little girl, it was the person that had the most eagle feathers would become the new chief. You see, the chief isn't the bravest or the toughest or the strongest. The chief is always the one who led a life of service and kindness to those around him him or her. So I told her and her classmates, go be a chief today. Be a good sibling. Express gratitude for those around you. Be a good friend. Be the kind of person that people want to be with. In that way, you will become a leader in your community. Leadership that's not rooted in power and authority but in service, kindness, and wisdom. But as important as it is to tell the story of the people, it's equally as important to tell the story of the land. In 2018, we were lucky enough to be able to purchase 550 acres of that sacred burial ground known as the Barrow of Massacre site. This was only the beginning of our journey that began more than a century and a half ago when the final shot was heard echoing through the Preston Valley. The day after we closed on that land purchase, I traveled to Utah State University and met with two professors in the Natural Resources Department. I told them that I wanted to restore the land to what it looked like in 1863, using my plant grandmother's plant diary as a guide. I wanted to know if it was feasible. And I knew that I didn't possess the skill set necessary to make that decision. Our first interaction almost four years ago brought us to where we are today. We have developed partnerships with all kinds of people and groups, the science communities at Utah State University and here at University of Utah and many others. As one professor said, this will be a living learning classroom for decades. This project requires more than just removing non-invasive plants and planting new trees. It involves restoring the watershed, which will require buy-in from landowners upstream. How will they feel about the reintroduction of beaver into their ecosystem? How will they feel about changing decades old farming practices as we create riparian buffer zones? We will be moving this spring Beaver Creek back into its original channel instead of down the side of the highway where the pioneers put it in a ditch with the goal of cleaning up that waterway to the point that we will be able to reintroduce the Bonneville Cutthroat Trout. This is a project that we cannot do alone. Over the last two years, we've been removing the half a million full-grown Russian olives. The scientists tell us that each Russian olive can consume 75 gallons of water a day per tree. We're almost done with the Russian olives. Thank you. <laughs> Healing begins, I think, when you bring people together. What we are doing at Bear River will not only symbolically, but literally having a long lasting impact on not only the Bear River, but on the future of the Great Salt Lake. 
we need to change our thinking and consider the health of not only the people that live along the Wasatch Front, but also the health of the watersheds that nourish our lakes and non-human species who rely upon the lakes. I said this at the rally Saturday and I mean it. The health of the people will always parallel the health of the lake. You see, scientists are finally discovering what indigenous elders have been teaching for generations, that all things are connected. Politicians are finally discovering what the Iroquois been doing for decades, that we must govern for the future of our future generations. This is what our young activists are saying when they demand climate justice. We cannot sacrifice the future for the sake of short-term profits. There's not enough science in the world that will overcome our selfish behaviors. We're in the midst of a massive paradigm shift. Now is the time to braid together indigenous knowledge and values about stewardship with cutting edge biophysical science that will create these watershed governance institutions that will create policies to steward the Great Salt Lake for future generations. These are indeed difficult times, but what brings me hope is that thousands of people now are coming together to say that our human being is connected to the well being of the lake. And the well being of the lake is connected to the well being of the watershed and the climate. We are truly all connected. And the actions that we take in the next decade will affect generations to come. Let's stay active, stay engaged, and keep coming together to protect and steward the lake that we all know and love. In conclusion, the Bear River Massacre is not just a Shoshone tragedy. It's an American tragedy. And I can even maybe say it's a global tragedy, but it does not trap us in death. As the story of the massacre and its ramifications becomes better known, I hope people will more fully recognize the significance in the experience of others. Their empathy will grow as they see ways to forgive and integrate and flourish, even while protecting your own unique sets of values. People will begin to see their own resiliency and see how my people have survived and continue to thrive. There's an old Native American proverb that says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. The world has ended for many things, many times. But in this era, this time, this now, is a never known time to create, to investigate, to listen, an event. And not because we have all the answers, not because we know the way but precisely because we don't. I do not know how to fix this alone, but I believe that abundance sprouts up in strange and probable places. What I do know is I will keep fighting alongside of you and many for foreseeable years, and I hope you will too. There's a certain poppy gets its germination cues from smoke after the devastating wildfires in California in 2019. The hills that were turned to black ash are now lined with these beautiful golden poppies. Similarly, we were all born to bloom. 
not in spite of the fire in our lives, but because of the fire in our lives. Our creator needs people that are on fire. Thank you very much for having me today. Yeah, if you have some questions, I'd be more than happy to spend a minute or two. I brought a few books because somebody on social media reached out and said, do you have any books to sell? That's all I have to my name right now. <laughs> it's like 13. But anyway, any questions? You're all invited January 29th at 11 a.m. It's on Highway 91, just two miles north of Preston. When you get to the end of the town, turn left like you're going to Oaks Teller, and you will run right into it. It's right on the highway. And we'll feed you buffalo chili. <laughs> That's free. Thanks again to Garrett Perry. Thanks to you for turning out. <laughs>